So what then might have been at stake in this particular conjunction of an attempted opening or freeing the land, an undeveloped form of shelter, a rejection of many aspects of modernity, and their avowed ethos of care at once of the land, of the planet, of persons, and of the self. Morningstar's ethos of openness was presented as the principle of Latwidden, just spelled out here, land access to which is denied no one. As claimed uh, in the manifesto that you see here of 1970, we found out that if you told no one to leave, the land selected the people who lived on it. You know, this is one of their ideologies uh, that I'll, I'll come back to, uh, uh, the sort of mythical figures that are under, underlying this. We also found out that in this supportive no-rules environment, hostilities could find little breeding ground. Private ownership of property and exploitation of land for profit came to be thought of not just as the unjust appropriation of the commons, but as the cause of a loss of innocence, or uh, uh, Lou Gottlieb called it a type of original sin. No trespassing signs, he boldly declared, are the cause of war, racial strife, and marital unhappiness. When you give free land, not free food or money, you pull the carpet out from under the capitalist system, he announced. So invoking uh, the same anxiety, he continued, once a piece of land is freed, no trespassing signs pop up all upon the adjoining roads. Uh, and so, you know, he's arguing that, that free rent was in effect the most powerful or, or potent uh, sort of leverage for transformation. Following a mention of Morningstar colonists in Time's famous cover story of hippies in 1967, the, the property quickly attracted a large number of residents and visitors, and with them, the attention of local public officials. Gottlieb was charged with operating an organized camp in violation of state public health regulations. Upon being arrested, he wryly announced, if they find any evidence of organization here, I hope they'll show it to me. Having constructed a bathroom and fixed up the communal kitchen in an attempt to be in accordance with the law, he pleaded no contest to the initial charges. But within hours of the plea, this, this hippie colony was raided by what one paper called a small army of county officials, uh, sheriffs, health inspectors, probation officers, even FBI officers, uh, building inspectors, uh, and a whole series of, of other characters. So it was following this raid that many of the, the so-called settlers or residents um, moved to Wheeler's Ranch and then they moved on to New Mexico uh, and founded a set of other communes. And so what we find then is the property is repeatedly condemned, uh, uh, raided, uh, the people rounded up, and, um, and the, uh, the, the site sealed. So the organized camp charge was eventually dropped, but further charges followed from contempt of court and trespass to fire and safety code violations, anything to discourage uh, what they figured as a nuisance. So in January of 1969, with Gottlieb still refusing to forcibly remove his people from the land on the grounds that it went against his religious belief, 21 people were, um, were arrested uh, 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 and charged with violating uh, the superior court order to vacate. Faced with ever-mounting violations and fines, in May of 1969, he went to the county courthouse and deeded the land to God in a notorious attempt to try and transfer the property to the public domain, to try and return it to the commons, as though God meant, you know, was somehow a manifestation of the commons. This legal maneuver uh, served to stay the injunctions for a small period, with judges, Catholic judges, unwilling to declare that God didn't exist. But in July of 1970, a superior court judge ruled, and I quote him, whatever be the nature of the deity, God is neither a natural nor an artificial person cap capable of taking title of Morningstar Ranch under California law. And he again instructed the authorities uh, to carry out um, uh, the writ against the property and to demolish all of the structures. So Gottlieb denounced the ruling as idolatry, as blasphemous, but the appeals to freedom of religion also proved useless. Sonoma County had, as the communards observed, started a broad-based policy of repression, including a punitive and discriminatory enforcement of health and building codes. Yes, yeah, so they would let other, other people live in poverty um, uh, elsewhere, but they wouldn't let these people choose to live in poverty. It became a political issue for the county officials to rid themselves of what they considered undesirable neighbors. 
So bulldozing the ad hoc settlements at Morningstar and Wheelers can be read on a first order level as simply a way to remove structures considered unfit for human habitation, an instance of the state acting on behalf of the welfare of its citizens. This is what they claimed, of course, uh, an act of enforcing the law when buildings were not up to code. Yet if we were to judge by the vehemence of the county's response, the stakes, of course, were much higher than health and safety for those who chose to live in these conditions. For the communards, the structures were a principal means of articulating and of disseminating images of alternative modes of life. They were tactical weapons in their battle over opening land. Building codes and bulldozers in turn had become the strategic weapons of the state uh, in their defense against what they considered to be attacks on mainstream American values. But it raises the question of whether what we're seeing here is something like the intentional destruction of a built environment as a means of destroying a corresponding culture. Something like an act of war that, were it between states, would be prohibited, of course, by the Geneva Convention. Before deeding the land to God, Gottlieb had tried uh, actually to deed the land uh, as a, a museum of folk architecture, an act seeking to preserve these structures uh, as a form of testimony to their way of life, basically to claim that they were a type of cultural heritage um, and, and, and use that as a way you know, to, to, to maintain them. And we might note that whether we recall the destruction, of course, of lower income city neighborhoods as crime filled ghettos, or at the time, of course, uh, in the 1960s, uh, the destruction of villages throughout Vietnam and later Cambodia as a form of herbicide, and of course, on a very different register, the use of bulldozers here in refugee camps. Um, yeah, what we're seeing here is the technology are repeatedly used as supposedly as a tool uh, of, of security, but in fact as a tool of herbicide. So to try and unpack the issues here, I want to return and take a closer look at what informed these highly idiosyncratic built assemblies and how they might have posed a challenge to security of land prices, of the supposed health of the population, of moral and social values, and of the productivity and hence the profitability of the workforce uh, to the capitalist state. So a section of open land of the manifesto called Our Beleaguered Homes that you see here outlines the, the sort of ethos uh, at work. How about building yourself a house, it asks. No, no, you don't need money, an architect, plans or permits. Why not use what's there? Suggesting that in the mild climate of California, one could simply join the, the squirrels and, and, and live in the branches of a tree or dig a hole hidden from the police, the text asserts, and this is a you know, very problematic, problematic sort of naturalizing claim that man has a nest building instinct just like other uh, just like other animals and it's totally frustrated by our lockstep society whose restrictive codes on home building make it just about impossible to build a code home that doesn't sterilize he goes on so it falls down in the first windstorm the second one won't Dirt floors are easy to keep clean. Domes are full of light and air. You know, again, to show the sort of incredible naivete about, you know, about the actual conditions of people uh, forced to live in these, um, uh, in, these sorts of, um, uh, in these sorts of dwellings. So if the cost of materials and do-it-yourself ethos certainly informed the non-normative character of these ad hoc constructions uh, at Morningstar, Wheelers, and beyond, as suggested in this manifesto, their forms cannot be explained simply as the lack of building expertise, or this does at times factor in. There are actually architects involved in this commune. The teepees, lean-tos, tents, open-sided A-frames, tarpaulins, tree houses, uh, school buses, uh, etc., were not simply expediencies. You know, they weren't just born of necessity, but again, they were a form of protest, one that took the form not of demonstrating in the street or on a university campus, but of demonstrating an alternative mode of life. In a short article, uh, in a magazine, Bill Wheeler, the other key figure here, noted that two by four, 16 inches on center, that's a conventional way of constructing houses in America, uh, that this does, just doesn't make sense to us. And he went on to suggest that they'd been seeking, testing, and theorizing an alternative to conventional techniques. As California and the whole country is progressively filling up with plastic architecture, he explained, impersonal and cold, pro prohibitively expensive, we feel we must present a viable alternative to the free and happy homes um, 
uh, of these free and happy homes that everybody joins in and builds. One of the most significant aspects of Wheeler's Ranch, he claimed, has been this evolution of a practice uh, of a philosophy of architecture. To Gottlieb too, uh, he goes on, uh, that the 16-inch stud, uh, yeah, the, the, the sort of building codes themselves, uh, were the issues. And he goes on, uh, only half-jokingly, to say this is an experiment in low-cost housing. If seeking affordability, though, the philosophy of architecture developed in these communes worked against key tenets of architectural modernity, functional distribution of programmatic elements like bathrooms, kitchens, bedrooms, dining room, etc., certainly the use of modern technology and materials, standardization, rationalization, structural stability, and even standards of plumbing, hygiene, lighting, uh, etc., where they were adopted, as in um, uh, the use of new materials like plastic uh, and the sort of troping uh, on aspects of modernity, they can only be read as wittingly parodic. Uh, where am I? Most had no kitchens or sanitary facilities, uh, and their materials and forms were intentionally sort of funky or crazy. Following the failure of the dream of a codified, regulated, technologically advanced and universal modernism to achieve the goal of housing for all, what we see here is a sort of unregulated hippie other stepping in to fill the, fill the gaps um, left by both the state and the forces of capitalism. Well, this is, yeah, this is what they're trying to produce. So importantly, we find not only a departure from modernist or conventional domestic aesthetics, as, as we see uh, in these images from, from CM and other uh, key points of architectural modernity, uh, but we also find a type of withdrawal from the very terms through which modern architecture had justified the discipline's ongoing role in social, hygienic, and economic terms. Modernist environmental ideals of access to light and air and management of the human habitat were key terms through which institutions like CM had lobbied both the profession and governments, and following the Second World War, they had become important paradigms for thinking about architecture and so-called human settlements by institutions like the United Nations. The statistically driven logics of building rationalization and regulation, those operating or, or so uh, these institutions claim sort of below the register of aesthetics, came to be increasingly coupled though in the late 1950s and 60s with the discipline's embrace of discourses of the human and social sciences. And so what we're looking at here are projects from North Africa in which architects started to collaborate with anthropologists and other social scientists supposedly to get to know uh, vernacular architecture in more detail, but actually to produce a sort of ever more efficient way of, of taking uh, modern architecture and, and resettling people, in effect. Um, so moreover, this accelerating and, and globalizing logic of late modernity was increasingly ill, ill, infiltrating architectural pedagogy and thinking through programs like uh, in London, the Architectural Association had a school called the Tropical School of Architecture, which was set up to do just this, to take European and American modernism and translate it into other, other global contexts. So I mentioned this connection uh, for two reasons. In the first instance, these, these forms of rationalization marked exactly the points at which architecture as a field uh, could be deployed within a logic of governmentality, giving it a role in what Michel Foucault theorized as the biopolitical regulation of the population. And in the second instance, it brings us back to this identification down, in this case, to pressures on developing countries. Mm -hmm. 